Hi everybody. We have been all about running for a couple of weeks. I know a lot of people have just started running, some for the first time in their lives and some, you know, maybe it's the first time in a while. And so I know that we've had a few different blogs about running lately and I really wanted to share with you today my actual real notes that I took when we went to that Jeff Galloway seminar. I know you've seen the little video clip from that. We had the most amazing day. That man is absolutely a legend. And I really learned a lot. And there were a few things that he talked about that have been, you know, along the vein of a lot of questions that I've received from everyone, you know, as we're all doing the couch to 5K or signing up for half marathons and everything. So I just wanted to run through some of the, the highlights, really, of our time with him that Sunday. Um, the first thing that he said, he opened with this, and this is so important. I'm going to read it word for word. Jeff said, there is no speed that is too slow and there is no amount of walking that is too much walking. That is so important because I know so many of us feel like if we're walking with cheating or you know, if we're not running a certain number of minutes a mile that we're too slow. And here we have a world champion, an American Olympian telling us there is no speed that is too slow and no amount of walking that is too much walking. That there for me just spoke volumes. It really moved me to hear him say that. He said for, to build our endurance that we need to slow right down and take way more walk breaks than we feel like we need. And this is when I had one of my little running epiphanies because I've always felt, as I know many of you have, that if you're running for a while and then you have to stop and walk, that walking is kind of cheating. And when he said this, I realized that I felt that way too. And I know, you know, intellectually that it's not, but in my heart, I always felt like if I had to stop and walk, oh, it just feels like cheating sometimes. And I finally figured out it's because I am having to stop and walk and being forced to stop and walk rather than intelligently working out my workout and building in walk breaks that are actually part of the planned workout. And as soon as that clicked in my mind like that, it's been completely different for me ever since. So if you plan to run a minute, walk a minute, run a minute, walk a minute, just as he suggests, then it's not cheating at all. It's part of your program, it's part of your workout. And I think that's really important to really embrace that. This is a man who's been running injury-free for over 30 years because he walks and runs and walks and runs, a minute walking, a minute running, and he'll do a whole marathon that way eight times a year. If he can do that, I think I can do that for one half marathon coming up in October. I'm going to do it. You'll see. So another thing that he said that I had never really thought about, you know, we all slow down when it's hot. He advocates slowing down 30 seconds per mile for every five degrees it is above 60 degrees. And I know summer right now, a lot of you are saying that, you know, it's in the 80s and above, even really early in the morning. So if you feel like, oh, gee, that wasn't my best run. I was really slow today. We have a world champion who's telling you that that's a good thing. And I had no idea that it would be as much as 30 seconds per mile um, for every five degrees above 60. It seemed like a lot but it really makes sense. Now, another thing that he advocates is to walk, to warm up, and you've heard me say this lots of times, walk for the first half mile or so, make sure you're really warmed up before you start running. And then he said to, to do that walk and then to jog really slowly for you know your minute or so as you're still warming up and then go into your minute run, minute walk from there. So you're really fully warmed up before you start your proper running, you know, at your normal running pace. And then he said to also walk to cool down. So when you finished your workout, walk that off for another quarter mile perhaps, or maybe even more if you need to. I love that I'm taking this from my notes. It makes me feel like you guys were there with me that day. It was so amazing. So speed training. A lot of us really do want to get a little faster. Now there is no speed that is, you know, like you have to run at this speed to be a real runner. It's whatever your goal is, but you know that I'm gonna support you for any goal that you set for yourself. So if you are trying to get faster, he recommends doing speed training one day a week if you're training for a 5K or a 10K, or one day every other week if you're training for a half marathon or a full marathon. He said, 
also when you're when you're doing your training when you're working on getting faster use a natural shorter stride you know you see some people out there especially the power walkers and they're out there and they're swinging their arms and legs and they've got this huge big stride he said that you're more likely to get injured when you're doing that and this is true too when we're doing sprints a lot of us me included have lengthened our strides when we're doing the sprints and apparently that's a lot more likely to cause injury he said make your stride really short and we practiced this in the class doing a shorter almost a shuffling stride as we were increasing our speed it felt great I wasn't half as tired so go out and try that out and he did say too that if you're overweight that that shuffle is actually a lot easier on your joints and I'm sure that you know a lot of people have tried that and found that to be true um, I heard a professor telling Shay to do that same thing she had a shuffling gait and I asked him about that and he said that that is the best gait so shuffle your feet you don't have to pick them up and do these great big lounding bounding leaping strides you know you're just hurting your knees so Keep those strides short, especially when you're going fast. Oh, and especially downhill. You all, know, you all know how I feel about running downhill. I'm so not a fan. But he said, if you are running downhill, definitely shuffle your feet. You do not want to pound on your knees as you're doing that. Uh, like me, Jeff also doesn't agree with running with an iPod. He says that he's seen some pretty significant injuries. You know, people have been racing along with music in their ears and stepped right out in front of a cyclist or something like that. So he said, if you are going to wear an iPod when you run, and he strongly recommends that you do not, but if you are, only have one ear in. So your other ear at least is, uh, you know, alert to what's going on around you. Now there are three signs of injury and I'm sure that none of this is a surprise but sometimes a reminder is good. The first sign of injury is inflammation or swelling and of course you can see that and you can feel it. Uh, loss of function, so if you can move one foot in a, a full circle and your ankle's fine with that on one side and on the other side it doesn't work so well, that's a sign of injury. And the third sign of course is pain and a lot of people are still in that kind of no pain, no gain. I think if there's pain get it checked out because if you keep running when you have an injury you're most likely to make it a lot worse. So he also said, and he was very clear about this, do not do speed work if you are injured, especially don't do speed work. Depending on the injury, you might still be able to walk and that's fine, but he said speed work when you're injured will definitely lead to much bigger problems. Now, some people have asked me about drinking water, you know, during a race. And for myself, I tend to drink a little less maybe, and I usually only race in the cooler months anyway. But he did say not to drink more than 20 ounces of water per hour ever in the race um, or when you're training or whatever um, because you can actually overhydrate and that actually is potentially lethal. You have to go way overboard to actually kill yourself doing it but it has happened. So no more than 20 ounces of water no matter what but he did say that it, when you're running you can only physically absorb five to ten ounces of water per hour. So if you're going past that water station and they've got you know usually an eight ounce cup and it's at least a half full what I usually do, I take a sip, have an ounce or so, and then I dump the rest over my head. And the water is nice and cold and I'm all hot from running and it feels really good. So over your head, onto your chest or down your back, it'll cool you off. But just have that little bit so it'll hydrate you. You can absorb it slowly, um, but you really don't want to end up with water sloshing in your tummy. And he said, if you can hear it sloshing, stop drinking for a little while um, because the, the blood that helps you to absorb water out of your stomach is obviously in your legs because you're powering yourself a so if you can hear the sloshing, stop for a little bit. If your mouth is dry though, you can always rinse your mouth out and then spit the water out. But please look behind you before you do that because I very nearly ran into somebody's water as they were spitting it out one time and it was really gross to me. So anyway, <laughs> um, me and my running stories, huh? So on to fat burning and nutrition for running. He is a big advocate of running for burning fat. And he said, and I absolutely loved this, because you know I'm all about, you know, go out and run and have a good time. But if you're really sucking wind and not having fun, then that's really not such a good idea. He said very clearly, if you are huffing and puffing, you are in an anaerobic state 
and you're burning glycogen, which is blood sugar, not body fat. So an aerobic activity is one where you can talk to the person next to you and you know your heartbeat is up, but you can still carry on a conversation. That's your fat burning mode. As soon as you're huffing and puffing and sucking wind, you're burning blood sugar. And here's where this got interesting and I really learned something from him on this. He said that if you burn too much of your blood sugar, when you get back from your run, you'll have a hunger response. And it might be later that day, it might even be the next day that your body freaks out and will cause you to really crave carbohydrates and um, you know, chemically you'll be driven to overeat. So he said, if you keep it more in the aerobic zone by doing the run walk, you'll burn plenty of body fat and you won't trigger that like really intense hunger response later. And of course, if you, you know, don't have a hunger response that leads to a binge, then you've saved yourself a bunch of calories and you're still working towards your goals. So I thought that was pretty profound. Now, another thing that he and I really agree on is that you do not need to do the carb loading dinner the night before the race. And this is another thing I learned. The, the food that you eat that fuels your body for the race is the food that you eat 36 to 48 hours before the race. So the big old carb dinner the night before, not helping. It's just filling up your body and uh, you know that, that could be inconvenient halfway through the race. He phrased it a little differently, but I know you know what I'm talking about. So he said the day before the race, you want to eat nice and light. You know, obviously don't go hungry, but you know, don't eat a lot of fatty food, of course no fried food, and uh, not too much roughage. You don't want to end up with too much fiber in your system on the morning of the race. Uh, he talked about the water with us. Um, and, oh, that's right. He said the, the food that you eat on race day, practice that. Just as you practice your race, just as you train for weeks or months before a race, practice with your food. When you're doing your training runs, try eating something different for breakfast that day or try not eating breakfast and see how that affects you so that by the time you get to race day, you know exactly what your best breakfast is, how much water you need to drink and how that's gonna make you feel through the race. So it's really doing your homework in, in the weeks and months leading up to your race. And I thought that was a really good idea to kind of play around and try different things and see what works best for you. Now, his final tip that I'll share with you today was about shoes. And again, I had never thought about this, but it makes a lot of sense. He says, when you find a pair of shoes that really works for you, you've run in them for a few weeks or maybe a month or so, and you love those shoes and they're perfect, he said, go back to the store and buy a second pair because you know they, they change styles and things all the time. And when it comes time for you to get a new pair of shoes after your 300 miles, you might find that they don't have those shoes anymore and you have to choose a whole new pair. So he said, find a pair you love, go back and buy another pair, and then once a week or every couple of weeks, run in that newer pair just so that you're breaking them in slowly, so that when you run your old shoes dead and they're no good anymore, you're not putting a brand new pair on your feet, you're putting a slightly broken in pair onto your feet. He said that'll be a lot more comfortable. So I think what I'm gonna have to do is maybe keep my shoes in the shoe box and keep a little tally of the miles that I've put on each pair, but it really does make a lot of sense. So Jeff, again, thank you so much. JeffGalloway.com, check him out. He has all kinds of information for you guys for run, walk, and what pace you should be doing, and you know what ratios and all that stuff. More information on nutrition. JeffGalloway.com is just an amazing resource. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>